say that you have a right to commit suicide, and there is institutional recognition of that right, but to also stigmatize, demonize, dehumanize the exercise of that right, according to the author, is really not to grant the right at all, right? Yeah, you have the right to do it, but you're going to be perceived as weak or infirmed or, or debased or what have you, right? The idea is, if I grant a right to X, then there shouldn't be, societally speaking, socially speaking, a stigma attached to those who exercise that right. And there is, in terms of suicide. So the question is, socially, have we really come to accept and this is a very good question, right? Um, I, there's no answer, per se, to it. There's yes and no, you know, it would be a good debating point. But I think it's a, I think it's a very interesting question. Um, socially, at least within the West, have we come to terms with an individual's attempt to exercise his or her right to suicide? If we say individuals have a right, and we say that they are free to exercise their right, are we socially ready to um, accept that, are we? Right? And on Facebook previously, maybe a year ago, I, uh, I addressed a point that I saw when I was watching a History Channel 2 um, discussion on it was sort of suicide in antiquity, uh, which was a lot, it, it was perceived in a different sense, right? There was a, there's a point at which it changed, the perception in the West changed. Um, and I think I have some ideas of, historically speaking, why it changed, but I'm not going to get into that now. But the stigma in terms of sort of the right to exercise suicide is undeniable in the West. It really is undeniable. So I think we should look at that critically. So the first step is how do we, re how do we, how do we, how do we, I wouldn't say, um, I wouldn't say justify the right, and I wouldn't say try to make individuals accepting, right? It's not a persuasive act. I'm not here to tell you that suicide is a good thing, right? What I am here to say is, listen, if there is a stigma associated with it, and as I said earlier in the series, a lot of us know people who have actually committed the act and seen how they've been stigmatized after they've killed themselves. As I told you, my, my instructor while I was in grad school studying for a dual graduate degree, kill himself. And, you know, it's, you know, you were selfish, you didn't think about your responsibilities and obligations and blah, 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 you were uncaring, you were cold and blah, blah, blah. I don't believe that. But there is a sense in which, you know, that is part of the stigma. How do we diminish that stigma? Or, in a sort of utopist, which I don't believe in, in a sort of a utopist, then how do we get rid of that altogether? Well, the first thing that we might do is to do this, to begin a social discussion, to talk freely about suicide, right? Um, if we do that, there's an attempt that we lose the taboo. Um, the taboo is weakened, is diminished by open social discussion. It's interesting that you'll always hear people say, you know, race relations or ethnic-based relations, especially in Europe. Um, race relations or ethnic-based relations are problemat problematized by the lack of the lack of empathy in external groups and the way that you allow others to see you is to have them understand your position right here's why I am the way that I am here's the culture that informed me here's how my sociolinguistic or socio-religious upbringing formed the way in which I think and everybody knows now that the more that we discuss um, race relations ethnic based relations and distinctions is the more individuals are likely to understand. It's not going to you know, diminish or completely extinguish, rather, um, conflict. No, there's still going to be conflict, but I at least understand your position. I see where you're coming from now. I still don't agree with you, and I still might want to kill you, but I understand your position. Right? That, that position and that ability to understand was facilitated by public discourse. I think there's more public discourse on race-based, ethnic-based conflict than there is on the internal sort of systemic familial, it's usually familial conflict, social as well, but definitely familial conflict that arises, that arises precisely from the taboo in discussing it. Uncle so-and-so killed himself, dad killed, killed himself, 
mom killed herself, my brother, my sister, so-and-so killed themselves in the family and we don't talk about it at all, right? No one brings it up. And there is a very grave danger in perpetuating the stigma of suicide by our refusal to openly discuss, um, openly discuss it, right? So in an attempt to safeguard our reputation as a family, if you will, as a society, individually, communally, familially, we, 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 we refuse typically to discuss it. But insofar as we refuse to discuss it, that refusal itself reinforces the stigma. It, it, that refusal to discuss it openly reinforces the taboo, right? So in a sense, this, a type of lecture series like this in a medical ethics um, discourse in an academic setting really undermines the taboo, right? That's the whole point of me doing this lecture series, right? This specific section on suicide, right? It undermines the taboo by making it a public discussion, by giving you hopefully the tools so that you can critically assess and critically analyze sort of the conceptual relationships between the beliefs and the act of suicide, and then hopefully, you know, use it for whatever ends that you're going to use it, you know, suicide prevention or just research. Step two, continued institutionalized support for suicidal persons, right? The institutions, um, um, social workers, case managers, therapists of all sorts need to, teachers even, need to support individuals that have the desire but seek to suppress that desire. I have the desire, the desire is there, it's an existing drive. I do have this desire, this drive to kill myself. Um, and I go to someone and I say, hey, I need you to help me. There has to be institutional support, right? There has to be government subsidization in a financial terms. There, have, there has to be more um, and more complex academic research into systems of justification, the stuff that I'm presenting now, so that we can help buttress the existing tools that psychiatrists and therapists have with more nuanced, more systematic tool set to help conceptually their patients um, suppress that desire, right? So educational outreach is the last part. Um, every person who completes the equivalent of a high school education would be provided with an orientation toward the problem of suicide, right? So that his idea, the author's idea, is in terms of delimiting the drive in individuals we recognize that individuals are members of social groups, and those social groups are influenced hugely by the educational system. So his suggestion is to introduce suicide prevention in the educational system. That could be very contentious, but um, I think it's a I think it's a, a suggestion worth noting. There are just two points that I want to read on the very last page on page seventy-two of this. So uh, I don't want to spend too much more time on this because it's already a half an hour that I'm that I'm in this section. Um, so, first paragraph on the top of page 72. A question has been raised whether incorporating concerns for suicide into our social institutions might depersonalize man to some extent. I would, um, I would anticipate the contrary. The more our social institutions reflect awareness, the more our social institutions reflect awareness of and concern for man's inner life and provide means for improving it, the greater the implied respect for life. By doing this, by talking publicly about suicide, by, if you will, being a proponent for suicide awareness, what we do is we don't depersonalize individuals, men, women, humanity. We allow an understanding. This is why people might be doing it. Let me, you know, after Dr. Campbell's lecture, I now see rather than just focusing on the behavior and trying to get them to stop the behavior without recognizing the system of justification that informs and legitimizes the behavior, let me talk about, let me get internally, let me think about systemically, conceptually, the justification for the behavior and talk about behavior modification in a conceptual sense, which for me is the only real effective way of doing it. Aside from prescriptions, right? I mean, nothing's more powerful than pharmacology. So even if this takes the form of providing a dignified means of relinquishing it. And then the next point, two paragraphs down, the critical words, 
the critical word is control. I would anticipate a decrease in the actual number of suicides when this process is when this procedure is established due to the psychological power of this issue. If I know something is available to me, um, if I know something is available to me and will remain available till I am moved to seize it, the chances of my seizing it are now thereby reduced. It is only by holding off that I maintain the option of changing my mind. During the period of delay, the opportunity for therapeutic efforts and the therapy of time itself may be used to advantage. And basically all the author is saying is that I have to me um, a network of institutional, social institutions that will help me cope with this drive. I can go to teachers, I can go to my religious leaders, I can go to um, social services, I can go to psychologists and therapists, um, I can go to any, I can go to friends and family, I can go to any myriad number of um, institutions and individuals to help me cope. The greater the tool set, conceptually speaking, because that's what I do, the greater the tool set that these institutions have in effectively negotiating if you will, it really is an internal negotiation, right? In effectively negotiating the and mitigating the desire to exercise my right to suicide, the more likely it is that I will continually defer that desire. It's not the case that that desire is probably ever, once you really have that desire, that that desire is ever going to be extinguished. It might be, in a very rare instance, but it's a means of suppression. How do I suppress that desire? without it being pharmacological, obviously. I mean, you can pop pills and suppress the desire. But conceptually speaking, for those who are motivated rationally to kill themselves, to justify their right, but they also want to stick around for whatever reasons, um, it's important to recognize that we need better and more effective means of, of accessing their systems of belief, which legitimize the right. Um, so that really concludes this section. Um, it, it, it's a it's a bit it's a bit it's a bit unnerving if you will it's a bit you know but this is what I was charged to do right? I, this is what I was charged to do the universe has molded me into the type of person that has these very intense it, you know lectures for me it's it's important to get the information out um, and hopefully someone will utilize it and if it if it makes someone's research easier or if people are now willing to to go seek therapy, to go seek help, um, then I've definitely done my job, right? So I can't, I can't um, do anything more than make the information accessible, make the conceptual relationships accessible. Um, and now it's up to you to decide how you utilize this this resource that I've created. So um, with that, I want to thank you for taking the time to watch my videos. I'm Dr. Jason J. Campbell. Have a good day.